This is a game called Ultimate Admiral Dreadnoughts. Uh, it's not terribly new. It's been in development for a couple of years. And it's basically a game where you design battleships and cruisers and stuff, and then you fight battles with them. Uh, there's a, a Naval Academy function where there's these first few were tutorials, and then there's a whole bunch of uh, various and sundry challenges uh, that you unlock as you go along uh, with m bigger, more expensive, more complicated ships and larger fleets, and starting really small. I did do quite a few of these a couple of years ago. At some point, they all locked again on some patch or update. You can also set up custom battles where you can just kind of build a few ships, uh, set up a, a few ships of whatever nation you desire, you know, China, Britain, France, etc. Set your uh, time period for tech and that sort of thing and just create some ships and have a battle. And that has been pretty much what the game has been during most of its development. Recently, not quite a month ago, uh, maybe last week in November, they uh, have introduced the first stages, uh, kind of the prototype of their ongoing campaign. Eventually, that will be uh, a long period of time, from the late 19th century up until perhaps uh, sometime in the 40s, maybe 1950 where you play as the leader of one of those nations' navies, uh, you know, whether like the secretary of the navy or the, or the senior admiral, you know, take your pick, and you uh, build your ships over time, play new ship classes, research tech, uh, fight the wars that come up, and there's alternating periods of peace, uh, some diplomacy and international politics uh, affecting you, and maybe there will be some limited influence on them. Anyone who has played an older game called Rule the Waves may be familiar with kind of that basic uh, setup. We don't quite have that yet here, and may not for some time. What has just been released uh, a few weeks ago in this game is short campaigns. You can either play as Germany or Britain and the entire campaign is a single war. A naval war basically in the uh, in the North Sea. Think Jutland during World War I. Something along those lines. There are no other nations and there are five specific start dates. When you first open the campaign you can only play in 1890. And then when you win the 1890 as Britain, then you can play Britain in 1900. Unlock that, and you can so forth and so on. You can go all the way up to the latest uh, time period currently in the campaigns is 1930. And then you can similarly unlock Germany along those uh, same start dates. And that's it. There is no period of peace. Not yet. So it's kind of a prototype, but it uh, newly added to the game. Uh, and then the other thing that recently happened with this game is, uh, you know, it's been under development, under development for a couple of years, but you could only get that uh, proto, you know, that alpha or beta, whatever it's called, uh, version from the Game Labs website. It has now been released on Steam. So between the campaign. Uh, and the Steam release, I guess about a week, maybe 10 days ago. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, there's a little bit of extra interest in this game, expanded interest, and uh, so I thought I'd show a campaign. <clears throat> and so I'm going to do Germany. I'm going to do the latest uh, starting year. I'm going to go ahead and do hard difficulty. I have played multiple of these short campaigns on both normal and hard. Uh, it's difficult to tell a difference. If I understand correctly, and I may not, uh, the main difference there is that hard is going to give the AI opponent 
uh, an easier time with their economy. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make the AI harder in battle or makes their ships better. They, they've just got more money. That's my understanding. Um, and since you can't actually see the opponent's budget during the war in game, uh, it's kind of hard to tell how much effect that this difficulty level is having. But we'll make it hard. Uh, I'm going to choose the historical behavior because I'm playing Germany. And the British historical behavior is presumably uh, a little bit more aggressive and scrappy than uh, the German AI behavior would be. If I were playing Britain here, I would probably put it on random so that we'd have a chance at kind of a scrappier opponent. Because uh, the historical behavior for Germany is fairly cautious, right? They're smaller, they don't have quite as big a budget, they're trying to preserve their fleet, uh, and when they fight, uh, you know, they may, they, they may be a little bit more likely to, okay, enough of that, and run and preserve their ship. That doesn't necessarily make them easier uh, to defeat uh, or harder to defeat. It's just a little bit different uh, behavior. And you may in fact do very well against Germany, but find it a little bit difficult to chase them down <laughs> and deliver the coup de grace. And then finally, there's a choice of you can either have the game make some ships for you and have a starting fleet kind of designed uh, by the AI or you can design your own ships. This is kind of a quick start option if you just want to get into fighting. And then uh, with Create Own of course uh, at first there will be some time designing ships before you get into the, the war itself. But we're going to go ahead and Create Own for two reasons. First, uh, the show the ship designer side of the game. Uh, and second, because the AI can produce some pretty good ships. Sometimes. They can also produce some pretty bad ones. Uh, they have more tolerance for some suboptimal settings that I'll talk more about in the ship designer window. Um, by and large, on average, uh, player designed ships are likely to be simply better than the average AI generated ships. Not always, but usually. So, that's the way we're going to do this. Germany 1930 hard, historical, and create own fleet. Now what the game is doing right now is it's, uh, if I had started on 1890, we'd just pop right in. The later your time era, the game kind of runs through a, a sort of uh, development of past history and, and goes through and randomizes technological developments. The specific text that we start with in 1930 on this campaign might be a little different than on a previous or a future 1930 campaign. And the AI British would have slightly different texts too. Sometimes you can pop into a, one of these like 1920 or 1930 campaigns and you've got a particular hull available that is really good and you can build a nice ship out of right out of the bat. You play that year again, well, you might have to research that hull. So there is a little bit of a little bit of randomization of starting conditions that gets a little bit more pronounced with each era. In the first era, in 1890, yeah, you pretty much start with the same stuff, uh, both sides, uh, every time. If there are differences, they're very, very minor as to be unnoticeable. So here we are. Uh, the AI, has, the AI, the British, have already built their fleet, and so we know what we're facing, and that could uh, help us make decisions here on what kinds of ships to build and how many of which to build them, how we're going to go after this. 
we have 769 million in our bank account and that's what we have to buy our ships with this number can vary as well I have had uh, some of these uh, 1930 campaigns start with over a billion as Germany uh, in this case I'm kinda toward the low end of initial starting funds and Britain could vary as well by and large Britain is gonna have a bigger budget than Germany especially since I have it on hard setting but even under normal they would have a bigger budget we are not going to be able to design and build remotely this start this starting number of ships so I'm not gonna to try to the campaign is one in its current form uh, a couple of different ways this provinces control that is fixed for now that will be a factor in the future provinces don't change hands in the current uh, state there is unrest this is basically popular opinion of how the war is going and it's directed at the government it starts uh, either zero or one at the start of the campaign and the higher this number is the worse when it reaches a hundred the government falls There's a revolution you get fired and the campaign is lost what causes unrest to go up a couple of things how the war is going are you winning or are you losing at sea in battles right if you lose a bunch of battles get some ships sunk especially if you get more ships sunk than the enemy unrest is going to go up closely related to that is naval prestige which is essentially how the government and also the public I think view your specific performance as in this case the uh, Imperial German Navy same sort of thing is this in this this number when it goes up is good you want to build prestige if it goes into the negative that's bad <laughs> the government's mad at you the people are mad at you and if it gets low enough you may not lose the war but you get fired again game over so these two are related but separate and you know battle success or battle failure is one major factor in driving that the other major factor is economic you have a transport capacity here this is basically uh, your country's merchant marine and commercial sea traffic and you start at 100 percent this is basically the number you know the transport capacity at which you maintain the government's current revenue which is in this case uh, almost 12 billion it says dollars I assume that's actually marks Reich's marks I guess and you adjust this slider to expand or contract that capacity right you need to keep it at a bare minimum at a hundred percent preferably higher but this is the threshold if you go lower then this number starts to contract okay the overall German economy is shrinking your own naval budget is a fraction of this revenue okay and this is the annual German economy this is our monthly naval budget when the big number shrinks our budget shrinks too and the people get mad and the government takes a dimmer and dimmer view of your own performance so as you lose transports and you lose a lot of them both the unrest and the naval prestige will drop so the whole idea of this game is to win battles and protect your transports and kill the other guys transports right keep that budget at least stable if not expanding 
So there's the political revolution. There's the naval prestige. Your own employment as the secretary of the navy or the naval minister. Either one of those can end the game if uh, you, that goes into the tank. As things get worse for a nation, the first thing that they're going to do is they may start offering you peace treaties. Hey, we've had enough of this. How about we uh, cease fire here, have a little armistice? That is the government trying to prevent things from getting worse before the government gets overthrown. It takes two to accept a treaty, so you can refuse and keep beating up on them. And that will eventually lead to a revolution. So our task is we need to build enough of a navy that we can effectively fight against uh, this past, you know, 40, Britain's 49 ships and have enough tonnage active and operational that we can prevent a blockade. We don't have to match them entirely, but we can't let them get too far above us. So we're only going to have a few ships. It's pretty imperative that they be pretty big ones. All right, Building a bunch of uh, destroyers and maybe some light cruisers is not going to cut it. It just isn't. So I think what we're going to do here is we're going to design and build a few battleships. Not five or seven if we count battle cruisers. Mainly as a counterweight to their seven capital ships. And then we're going to build some heavy cruisers. Again, not ten, but enough. And that's all we're going to go with. We don't have, and this may look like a big number, it isn't. These ships are expensive. And our strategy is going to be to try to fight as short a war as possible. Uh, we are not going to prevail in a long uh, huge naval expansion uh, an economic war that drags on for years and years we need to prevent England from defeating us economically quickly and score enough tactical victories out here in the North Sea and the English Channel and you know here on the map uh, strike enough uh, quick, uh, decisive-looking battles to sway public opinion and persuade the British government that it's just not worth the cost of pursuing and achieve a peace treaty. We'll see if we can do that. In order to build some battleships, we need to design some battleships. We're going to have few ships, and despite the uh, limited budget, the few that we have need to be good ones so we I'm not gonna economize a whole lot and try to build cheaper ships uh, I am going to reduce the tonnage just a hair to make them a little bit cheaper just a little bit uh, the max we can build with our shipyard capacity currently is a 49,400 ton battleship could build that. I'm going to shave that off just a bit. And something like perhaps, let's go with a 46,000 ton ship. Why am I doing that? Because it will be a little bit cheaper. We might get a 50 million dollar costing battleship instead of a 54 million. And uh, over several ships, that can add up and that's going to be a factor. Need it to be reasonably fast, just as a starting uh, point. Probably 28 knots for a 46,000 ton battleship is reasonable. It doesn't have to be able to catch everything. Uh, you know, enemy destroyers and light cruisers are likely, not certain, but likely to be significantly faster. <clears throat> but at 28 knots, we can maintain enough distance that our uh, secondary guns and, and armament can f have enough time to wreck them before they get really close and get in torpedo range which actually is pretty far in 1930 the torpedoes uh, are a significant threat 
We need a good bit of range because this influences, it's like a multiplier on our tonnage for uh, either imposing or preventing, which is what I'm trying to do, uh, a blockade. I hope I will be able to maintain maximum bulk, bulkheads, uh, which will limit flooding from damage. If I can, uh, if not, if we need the tonnage, uh, willing to compromise down to many. But let's see if we can do maximum. We want oil that reduces the tonnage devoted to fuel. It is more costly. We'll go with balanced boilers, which will increase horsepower. Geared turbines, more efficient, less weight. We need a fair amount of maneuverability in our battleship. There's going to be a lot of torpedoes in the water. The AI loves to load on tons of torpedo launchers. There's going to be a lot of torpedo dodging, so we need a maneuverable ship. Auxiliary machinery helps with that. It also helps with damage control. Let's go with at least auxiliary two. Uh, and shaft two, helping acceleration turn rate. Best balance, uh, I say best, uh, the most maneuverable rudder we can get, that is the unbalanced rudder. And then with steering, there's a trade off here. Uh, the most maneuverable steering gear is electric. Electric 1 and then electric 2. If you have fully electric steering gear, that's drawing a lot of electric power from a lot of other uses on the ship. So because of that, that big power draw, that affects other systems and it decreases your ability to operate damage control gear for water pumping and ship repairs and also slows down the turrets a little bit. However, uh, I want that I want that turn rate. I'm going to go ahead and take the risk with electric two. <clears throat> Best possible armor. It is costly, but it uses less weight and is more effective. Even with the maneuverability, we may take some torps now and then. Let's build in some anti torp capacity into our hull. Double hull. I am passing up the triple hull. I'm not completely gold plating every single category. There's not enough weight for that. And we'll go with reinforced bulkheads one. Same thing. We may take some flooding now and then. Let's go for anti-flooding two for now. See if that works. We may have to drop down to anti-flooding one. And then the Citadel, that is kind of the most heavily armored central portion of the ship. Uh, reducing damage chance, reducing ammo detonation chance, reducing flash fire chance. It does increase weight and increase armor cost, but it also further strengthens the armor. There's three different grades. would love to get Citadel 5. That would be the tankiest. Don't think we're going to be able to afford that weight or cost. We'll go with the middle one. And those are the basic uh, weight components and uh, just the basic machinery. More components will get added as we, as we add other gear. Need a tower. This is like the bridge, the superstructure. And we want the... I'm going to spend the money on the, the, the best one there is because that there's a, it has a whole bunch of effects. Your communications, your accuracy, most important. And it also, uh, the more internal volume you have in your superstructure, this game models that that improves your ability to conduct damage control. It's also a little bit higher, so you can spot stuff visually further away, and it helps your torpedo spotting. <laughs> That's going to be key. So there's the forward superstructure essentially, and then there's an aft superstructure as well. And we're gonna try to get them as close together as we can. All right, for 28 knots, we need a funnel 
uh, there's only a couple of choices. You want high engine efficiency because that affects your range, uh, your power at top speed, your acceleration when changing speeds. We want the lightest funnel that we can get to save money and to save weight that does the job. With the smaller funnel, we can, well, that, heck, that gives us 100% engine efficiency already. No need to use the larger one. We'll put it here for now. We may shift. You wind up having to do a lot of weight balancing as you get more stuff on, and uh, some of this stuff may shift forward or aft later. With the towers, we have some new options. Range finders for our guns. There's going to be a lot of long distance shooting with a battleship. Uh, there's range C, that is coincidence range finder, and range S, that is stereoscopic. The S is more of a long range optimized range finder, while the C is for more medium to short range. Okay, You get more base accuracy and aim speed with coincidence, but you get better long range accuracy uh, with stereoscopic. I usually like to put the stereoscopic on the battleships and the battlecruisers, but I think I'm going to go with the coincidence rangefinder here because it weighs less and costs less while still giving us a really good base accuracy modifier. I'm giving up a little bit here, but I think this, this is all right. This is not a place to skimp best possible acoustic tech you can you can get because that increases your torpedo spotting range that's, that's going to be necessary there's some communications gear here communications range affects if this ship is the flagship and it has other ships in company more communications range means there's a larger radius within which you give a flagship buff to your ships and company. Every battle in which a, a battleship goes, it is almost certainly going to be a flagship. At least one of your battleships is going to be. So this is, I think, worth spending the money on to buff the entire group. It also gives us not exactly radar, but it gives us radio direction finding. So it won't give a specific location in a, in, or a range, but it'll give us a direction where the enemy is. That's really useful in uh, when it first comes available around uh, 1920. It's not as important now because we have actual real radar at this point. However, I'm going to go at you know what, I'm going to take the 25%. Let me think about this a second. No, we're going to take the RDF. And then finally, we're going to take uh, this first generation radar, which improves our spotting and further improves gun accuracy. And it also reduces the accuracy penalty uh, during nighttime, which makes sense, right? That all adds some weight to this forward tower. And before we start adding on other dubobs, uh, this you know, armor is kind of a place where you can fine tune your final tonnage. Um, so let me set kind of some minims here. Something around 13 inches is probably okay for the main belt. And yeah, maybe a little more. I think 4.5 is okay there. In my opinion, the, the AI, the, auto, the ship designer kind of defaults to a little bit thicker main deck than you really need. All right. The belt protects against direct fire. That's protecting basically the sides of the hull. 
Deck armor is about long range plunging fire, right? The shell has a much higher trajectory and it comes down on you and it's more likely to hit the deck. And if it penetrates, it goes straight into the innards of the ship. And However, I believe that the our accuracy is going to be substantially better than the enemies, especially at longer range. I am going to I'm going to drop the the deck armor a little bit. Save a little bit of weight there. Conning Tower 15 ought to be okay. We will take a lot of hits, particularly, you know, we'll get peppered with smaller caliber guns too. A lot of that's going to hit the superstructure, which is our towers and our funnel primarily. Uh, I think we can drop a little bit here. I don't want to go below an inch and a half. Yeah, let's just say 1.6. And some of these may be tweaked later, but that's kind of an entering argument. Barbettes are basically little pedestals upon which you put turrets. As far as I can tell, the specific size of the barbettes doesn't really matter that much. As long as it's big enough to hold the gun you intend to use, uh, I think it's fine. For example, this medium barbette one, as far as I know, isn't any he more heavily armored or safer than, or isn't any less armored or safer than the medium three, or the enlarged barbette, or the very tall barbette. That's kind of controlled in a different uh, component, which we'll get to in a moment. And uh, I think that this medium uh, medium one is too small, but I, I think this medium two is going to be okay for the guns I intend to use. Put one forward. And we'll put one back here. Which leads us, leaves us, leads us <laughs> to guns. And there's a number of different options. We could put as small as nine or ten inch guns. That would be rather silly for a battleship of this size and era. And we've actually got the tech to go all the way up to 17 inch guns. Uh, all right, that's too big. Just as important as the caliber is the quality of the gun. We've got Mark II 17 inch guns. That's a relatively new technology, all right? It's not quite up to snuff yet as far as technological maturity as some of the smaller calibers. We've got Mark II 17s. We've got Mark II 16s. We've got Mark III 15s and 14s. And then down around 12 or 13, they're up the Mark IVs, okay? So these are smaller, but they're more accurate and they fire faster. Those are a bit too small. These are too big and not quite as accurate. I think right here and probably the uh, the Mark III 14 or 15 inch guns is probably good enough. I'm going to... I'm going to see if I can get these 15 inches on here. So there's our caliber selected. And we have an option of single barrel all the way up to quadruple barrel turrets. One thing that the ship designer does not make very clear is that, kind of like the calibers, the number of barrels per turret also increase in quality over time. these single and dual turret uh, configurations have been around a lot longer and have been more refined than the triples and quadruples. And you can see that in that the gun is the same. They're Mark III 15-inch guns. But if we look at the triple barrel, 
we see that the accuracy at say 10,000 meters is 5.3 percent whereas with the dual it's 5.6 percent these guns are more accurate and that's because in 1930 triple turrets They've been around a little while, so there's a, but there's still a small accuracy penalty to them. Ten years ago, when triple per turrets first become available, that accuracy penalty is bigger. And now it's smaller. And then these quadruple turrets have just been introduced, and they are significantly less accurate than either the triples or the duals. I think I'm going to go with the duels for a couple of reasons. Partially because they're a little more accurate, but also because the triple turrets are heavier, more costly, and I can really only realistically do three of them. You know, probably two forward and one aft, which was, was a pretty common configuration. But I also have to worry about the, uh, or consider, the, the ship's balance. And if I put two turrets forward, one turret aft, uh, we may wind up a little front heavy, uh, stability wise. And uh, I don't really want to go down that road. It would be easier to do if these particular uh, tower sections weren't so long. Sometimes they'll be a little bit more compact and you can fit them closer together and leave more deck space and that three turret uh, triple configuration becomes easier to do but I like the duels here and we're going to go with four turrets two forward two aft let's see if I can fit uh, let's see if, if, if I can perch it on this barbette <laughs> there maybe it'll fit there yeah She'll perch up there. Looks a little funny. But it gets the job done. I'm going to move this barbet. Just a little bit. Away from the deck house. And there she goes. Okay, uh, I can't fit this turret on here. Which means the whole thing has got to come forward just to, just a hair. perfectly balanced so far. We've also used up almost all of our tonnage, but the big heavy things are mostly all on now. Uh, we want some barbette uh, protection. The more protected they are, the less chance of ammo detonation and flash fire, which are pretty catastrophic events when they occur. Uh, so we need some, again, if we gold plate it with the best possible. That's super costly and uh, weighty but I think barbet eh, barbet 2 ought to be all right we want these guns to fire fast and we have automatic fully automatic reload available you don't always get this in 1930 last time I did 1930 I was limited to semi-auto this is gonna add some weight and some cost that's, I think that's worth it yeah, we've gone overweight. Uh, I think I've already gone electrical in the steering. I don't want to uh, further risk with electrical turrets. I'm just going to go the advanced hydraulic. The turrets will, the turrets will not traverse as fast. 
but uh, I think that's an okay trade-off. You have a choice of light, standard, heavy, or super heavy shells. The heavier shells, uh, they do more damage, but they're less accurate and they take longer to reload. And they also have increased flash fire and ammo detonation chance. I don't really want to make that trade-off. Light shells are the, op or the opposite. Less chance of a catastrophe, more accurate, reload faster, they do less damage and less penetration. I don't want to make that trade-off either. Standard is fine. Uh, yeah, we have two ch choices of uh, technology for Corda. For this is the what basically what uh, propels the shell out of the barrel and across its range: cordite and tube powder. Tube powder is the. I think the superior of the two. You get more. Uh, you get more damage and range, uh, but not as much uh, flash fire protection from cordite. This is actually not a bad one either. But two powder, I think, is the best one. Improves their accuracy, uh, helps with reload, helps with penetration, and of course, it's more costly. But it's less flammable, so less volatile tube powder and then this is the explosive explosive charge of the shell itself once it reaches the target uh, picric acid is basically a, a, a high explosive uh, shell charge it decreases penetration uh, TNT is better I think okay I think those are the big ones. I'm not putting torpedoes on this ship. I'm not sure I will put them on the cruisers. And we need to find 923 tons to shave off somewhere. I believe... Uh, One of the entering arguments should have been crew capacity. This crew quarters, you have three options for your crew size. Cramped is basically bare minimum, right? The ship operates at 100%, but even light crew losses from uh, damage will start to degrade your capacity. At standard, you've got some redundancy some cross training just because you take a few guys uh, casualties will not immediately drop you below 100 percent in functioning the ship and then spacious is yet more crew and you can take fairly significant losses before the crew operating the ship begins to become a detractor but that's more birthing areas it's more guys that's more cost and more and more tonnage for this internal space for all that uh, facilities which isn't just sleeping but you know the mess decks the ship's laundry all that sort of thing I would have liked to get standard uh, that's not gonna work we'll go with cramped and I'll go ahead and drop two mini bulkheads I think I'd rather do that than lose my uh, flooding or degrading my flooding capacity. But now we've bought back some weight. How about reinforced bulkheads too? Nope, I don't like that. We've really only got 170 tons to play with. All of these hull, they're going to weigh a lot more than that. I think mainly we just uh, buy ourselves a little bit more armor. Let's make these turrets nice and beefy. It's not cool to lose a main turret.
And we can tap. I want, I want to tack a little bit back onto superstructure. One tick. Okay. And uh, can we squeeze? I don't think we can squeeze a, another tenth of an inch onto the main belt. Exactly. 46 out. <laughs> No, no, no. I haven't even put the darn secondary guns on yet. Okay, so obviously the 15 inch guns are the main battery and that's what we're gonna, that's gonna be what we're mostly killing with. Uh, we need some additional firepower for like light cruisers and destroyers. <clears throat> I'd like to get a set of dual five incher turrets, at least four, if not five per side. Basically every pair costs us another hundred tons. So we're talking at least 400, 500, or maybe 500 tons extra. Well, we can't just go with only 15 inch guns. That's not gonna work, so. Okay. I'm gonna try to get five on each side. I'm not gonna put them right up on the deck edge. That increases our roll. from the deck edge. Okay. I think that'll be all right. We probably have an option for even some smaller guns elsewhere. But, uh, and we could maybe plop a few three inches here and there, or not. Not a whole lot of uh, emplacement points on the towers themselves for this hull. Some other configurations, the little gun emplacements all over the towers. Maybe the British had it. Okay. So now I've got to find 543 tons. Let's bring these armor up. Let's go back down to 16 and a half for the turret fronts. Six inches on top of the. Anyway, bring that. Oh wait, let's uh, bring that superstructure back down. Okay. Um, bring down that communications range. We're not going to have that big a navy, which means on an individual battle, we're probably just going to have a couple ships at most, and we're not going to be spread all over. I think I can give up some comm range. Uh, given that we have radar, I think I'm okay with giving up that RDF direction fire. In a 1920 scenario, I probably would not be willing to give that up. Let's drop this to advanced. Oh, that did it. Wow, the radio is heavy. What's the difference there? 15% tower weight, 15% secondary versus 25%. Given how big the, I mean, what was that? 46298. 5607 700 tons ish in radio gear really they may need to look at that all right 
Well, that may be enough. I can get my maximum. Um, let's go. Let's see if we can fit standard crew. Nope, doesn't like that. What about our maximum bulkheads? Nope, doesn't like that. Nope. Okay. How about reinforced bulkheads? Nope, doesn't like that. I think I'm just going to buy back that armor I just shaved off. Just do a couple tenths of an inch all around until it cries uncle. <laughs> okay. Deck armor's heavy. Just slide up the turret armor a little bit. Nope. With the top. Nope. The five inches are already maxed out. That probably means Conning Tower is really the only place to. Okay. That's two tons off. I don't think there's any other incremental where we can shave more finely than that. If we had a bunch of little bitty guns, we could play with that armor for a ton either way, but this is fine. This is going to be our Freethoff, I guess that's pronounced, battleship. And they're going to cost us $93 million a piece, which is expensive. But... If I had started with that initial, what was that forty nine thousand four hundred? Uh, they would be over a hundred million apiece, and across three or four battleships. That's you know, like thirty million dollars. So I think this is going to be okay. And this video is already longer than I had intended because I talk a lot and I will design the heavy cruiser hopefully a little bit faster now that I've kind of explained what all these components do uh, at the beginning of the next episode.